Welcome to Good Game, your no BS insights for crypto founders. Can I get a quick gauge of sentiment? Bullish, neutral, or bearish cosmos? Because I'm, I'm hearing conflicting things again. Bearish, short term, neutral, long term. Mm. I'm neutral. Well, can you actually be bearish short term than neutral long term? Because I kind of agree with Zaki that they have like a 12 month window of opportunity. So if they don't succeed in, within the next 12 months, quote unquote succeed, do they really have another shot at dethroning Ethereum? Yeah, because I'm slightly optimistic of them executing something interesting, but still not fully convinced that even if they execute, it's going to be powerful enough to actually have some big, particularly like long-standing ecosystem or value prop. Looking for your next startup idea in crypto? Check out our request for startups list and get inspired at alliance.xyz forward slash ideas. Welcome to Good Game. This topic is going to be a very interesting topic around the modular thesis and uh, more or less to understand how that's going to affect the Ethereum ecosystem, how it's going to affect founders, users, and then more importantly, how it's going to affect its other blockchain networks like Cosmos. But before we get started, uh, we have a, a new guest. Uh, his name is Dimitri. Dimitri, do you want to give a quick background? Yeah, sure. Happy to be on. Yeah, research partner at 1KX, generally focused on research, do a lot of writing in the space across a number of topics. I've been more towards the infrastructure side of things, app chains, interop, portfolio support, things around token design, go-to-market strategies, BD and partnerships, and general investment duty. Um, before that, led investments and research at a crypto family office called Bollinger Investment Group, did around 25 investments with a firm there. And before that, spent a year with a fund called Coin Fund for a year also doing research and DD. So overall, investing in crypto since 2017, life pre-crypto, much more boring, spent six years working at a bank across some growth strategy and uh, innovation roles. And Dimitri, like, uh, you know, when people said they've, they've been around since 2017, you've actually been around since 2017. I remember reading your articles <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> back in the day. Uh, I think you were still at Berkeley, um, from what I remember. Um, yeah, I think you first, went to Berkeley, right? Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. Uh, first piece was on uh, token standards. Yes. So just yeah. around when 1155s are coming out, uh, just after CryptoKitties, uh, uh, other yeah. standards that, uh, that are coming out, like 998. And interestingly, now we are seeing a re-emergence. I think it's almost like a token standard summer between yeah. 4337, some cool ones like 6551. Turns out this is actually an interesting but a market for teams as well. It's it, it, it's your crypto equivalent of regulatory capture. Uh, 6551 is interesting, but uh, let's not go off on tangents because it's so easy <laughs> to go in crypto. Uh, but... Let's talk about the modular thesis. There's been a lot of content around the modular thesis. And, you know, there's this new narrative of why we need to have our own data availability layer, our own rollups, et cetera. But it could be pretty much broken down to a few functions, right? Uh, consensus, data availability, execution, and maybe even system of bridges or bridges are like the three to four that I think are like the most important when we think about like modularity. So maybe diving deep, maybe Fuda or, or Dimitri, do you want to talk about what is the modular thesis? Yeah, sure. Uh, like I will start, but uh, I will let you, Dimitri, also add your uh, thoughts. So modularity is a kind of a new thought in the, our space because monolithic chains are suffering now. So like each chain, when when Ethereum started, no one would speak about modularity. What modularity are you speaking about? Like everyone is trying to capture users. So all the chains started at monolithic. The chain does everything possible, right? Like it does execution, it does consensus, it does data data availability or data storage, it does settlement of the transaction. So all the four main functions of a blockchain have been in one monolithic block. And there was actually, this actually led to, uh, it was a good design choice at this point because you cannot just build five pieces in parallel. So as Ethereum started to get users and the, the network started to get crowded, people started to think, okay, we need to actually start unbundling these pieces to achieve better throughput. And we saw this unbundling actually at a very interesting level. The first modularity happened at the node level, like some protocols like Flow, for example, said we can actually unbundle these four pieces into different kinds of nodes, but all of them are in the same network. So the Flow network has different four different kinds of nodes, all using the same token, but still four different functionalities. It was recently when Ethereum changed the roadmap to roll up centric vision that we started actually having discussions about 
oh, we can actually have these four different pieces as four different chains. And we are seeing actually some chains like Celestia coming to fill only one of these pieces, like data availability and consensus. And we are seeing rollups coming to fill the part at the top, which is execution. Rollups will do execution. We can do everything else on the L1. So of course, there is so many designs of rollups. So I will let Dimitri take it from there. If you have any thoughts or like, you also, Dimitri, you can walk us through like what kind of, what different kinds of rollups uh, or like modular designs that you can see. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. I agree with you. It came from a need of scalability. I don't think that you could fit, you know, the entire, uh, you know, global economy on top of one monolithic infrastructure. I also think about it as blockchains are fundamentally software controlling hardware. And so as you scale, I think what helps as a mental model is how do you create more specialized hardware that does a specific thing and the kinds of uh, hardware requirements that you might need for DA is very different than what you might need for execution or in the flavor of a ZK rollup. If you have a prover, that hardware looks very different than if you have a normal uh, or like a, a regular ETH to consensus client. So a lot of the work around modularity, I think also revolves around how do you start to specialize your hardware to actually achieve more scalability. And yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting flavors. I think we are seeing it mostly around DA and execution. I think there's a lot of very interesting experiments that we'll see around DA layers being live between Celestia, Polygon Avail, Eigen DA, all very cool uh, ideas for a 44 dang sharding. Um, I think in practice, we're seeing the most traction right now with the ones that are actually live between Optimistic and ZK rollups. A question of whether you, you use crypto economic versus cryptographic security. Before uh, we dive deeper, Chao, any questions that we want to answer by the end of the episode that, that we're looking to uh, learn more about? The main question that, that bugs me, that has been bugging me for a while, is how much complexity is too much? Because on our last episode, we talked about Solana, which is the antithesis of modular architecture. And obviously, there are trade-offs, but the, the, the nice thing about Solana is that, at least conceptually, it's simple. It's yeah. not easy, but it's simple. Consensus, execution, data availability layer, uh, they're all done at the same layer. Uh, there's only one layer, one blockchain. Uh, Ethereum started this way, but Ethereum is moving to more modular. And with all these different layers unbundled, is this too complex from an engineering perspective and, and also from the perspective of builders? Like, picture yourself as a builder who is new to this space and you see a bunch of names, Arbitrum, Optimism, Ethereum, Polygon, Eigenlayer, Celestia, what the hell do you do with all these things, yeah. right? So the question is, is this too much complexity? That's the main yeah. question I, I want to answer. Got it. So maybe um, for you know, some of our audience members that don't know what the modular thesis is, maybe talk. we should talk a bit about what is consensus and you know, what does that mean for like Ethereum, right? Like ordering of blocks, to is data availability, where does the transactions get stored? And is that transparent execution environment like with EVMs? And then, you know, I also like to touch on bridges because I think bridges will become an important part of our conversation towards the end. So maybe talking about each of these like Lego blocks and what are the startups that are building in these Lego blocks? And then maybe we can dive deeper from there. So I can take uh, the first step at that because it's, yeah. uh, it, it can it can go along with along okay. with that. So let's just start from the application layer because application layer is very obvious. Let's say that you are trading a, on a Unis in Uniswap. For example, you are exchanging BB token for USDC or something, right? So you, as a user, emit a transaction. You create a transaction. I want to sell this token, right? Someone else will come and buy this token or the liquidity provider position will change, right? So this is a transaction. This transaction affected your balance only, right? So it affected your individual state. We call this state, like your balance on the chain, Your what you hold is just called a state. So when you emit a transaction, you change your own state. But at the same exact block, Imran, Chow, Dimitri, all of you are emitting transactions, right? So we need to kind of settle all these transactions. So after execution comes settlement. We need to update, execute these transactions and update everyone's state. We call this settlement. So everyone knows their new state after that. But do we agree on that? 
we have to agree on that. The network as a whole have to agree on that. That's why validators, each validator in the network have to re-execute the transaction and all of us have to agree on the new state. And once we agree on the new state, we call this consensus. So we achieved consensus on the new state. So the new state now has to be stored somewhere because any new comer to the network or any new transaction need to know what is the state of the wallet before it starts. So now we need to store this state somewhere for other people to be able to read it. And this is the data availability, where this data exists. And right now, where does it get stored? Yeah. Like now, everything is stored in the, on Ethereum. It is stored in the main blockchain. We have something called cold data, which is kind of, let's, con- let's consider the state as a memory. Your computer memory, your hard disk. You throw your data on your hard disk, and now the data stays there for any people to come and read from it, right? So at a higher level, modularity means that you have execution layer to execute transactions. You have settlement to know each one's balance, every individual balance after this execution. Then you have consensus that we already have to agree on the new state and that availability at the, at the bottom, which is like, we need to store this data somewhere to be able to retrieve it and know what the state of that blockchain at. So this is a very quick description of the four layers. Got it. Let's talk about like, uh, we touched on this a bit, which is data availability, right? Um, which is, we have a couple things happening on the macro side, right? You have like Deng sharding from the Ethereum side. You also have like Egan layer and others that are like building within the data availability layer. So maybe uh, let's talk about what that means for founders. I know there's a concept of restaking as well, but what does it mean for the end rollups and people that are building the space? For me, I think it's a matter of cost structure. Like the interesting part is, for every dollar, and, and, and we're finding th- this out in real time, you know, for every dollar that is spent on gas, when you split that out, what proportion it goes to DA, what proportion goes to execution and, and settlement. And so the economics here are very interesting to observe in, in real time. And what we don't know uh, that, again, we'll find out is, is it, you know, 80 cents on the dollar that is going to be paid for uh, for DA for actually storing this, or is it 20 cents or is it less? Uh, in my perspective, it's primarily a cost and uh, security question where, for example, you have one construction called a Validium where DA is stored amongst a separate set of nodes. And it's usually a smaller subset. It's usually cheaper to store for a lot of teams you know, do they need ETH L1 equivalent DA security? If so, there's going to be a higher willingness to pay. But if they're fine with it being stored somewhere cheaper, then maybe it's a cost question for them. Maybe they could reduce the overall transaction costs for those application developers. My sense is for DeFi protocols on ETH L2, you know, often your DA is your weakest link because you uh, you need them, for example, for uh, uh, fraud proofs. So if it's the weakest link and you want ETH L1 equivalent security, then a DeFi protocol might say, I need ETH L1 equivalent DA as well. So then maybe they might be more willing to pay the cost for, uh, for 4844. But for a game, Maybe they're fine with a Validium construction. And so for them, they might use a cheaper DA option. I have an anecdotal data point related to what you just said about uh, the, um, cost structure. So I, I talked to a very specialized ZK Rollup project recently, and they told me that the DA, the data availability, accounts for about 80% very roughly 80% of the, the cost. And the remaining 20% is everything else, like execution, consensus, blah, blah, blah. And um, the reason why he came up with this number is because the alternative of putting DA on Ethereum is to put the DA on, a, let's say, like at the extreme, uh, put it on, on AWS. And if you put the DA on AWS, you can basically save 80% of the cost of, of ultimately settling, settling on, on Ethereum. So just an interesting data point. Was this an optimistic rollup? Just to no, it's be- DK. So, ZK. so the, the okay. so the twenty remaining twenty percent, a big chunk of it is actually the zk prover. Yeah. So it's it's a combination of zk proving and consensus, but you know the, the exact breakdown is very hard to estimate. It, this is more of a in, intuition based uh, estimate. 
That's interesting. That's very surprising for me, actually. I thought it was going to be the other way around. I thought that DA might actually end up being relatively commoditized outside of ETH L1 equivalent DA. Because as more of these solutions come up, you know, it, it, it feels like a more commoditized product to me than having globally secure settlement layer that could secure trillions right. of, of TBL. That's really interesting. But you're talking about the future. In the future, this stuff will be very commoditized. What I'm talking about is, is the current state of things. So today, to settle the data from a rollup onto Ethereum layer one, 80% of that is, is, is DA. Our views are incompatible with, with each other. But also EIP 4844 will reduce the, the 80% of DA down by an order of magnitude, one or two order, orders of magnitude. At least that's what, what they think will, will happen. Why is that? Right. I mean, that, that's, that's the goal of uh, EIP 4844. I, I mean, Fuda, uh, you probably know this better than I. Yeah. Okay. Like, as exactly what you mentioned, Chad, the cost of storing that data of transaction from a rollup to Ethereum is 80% of the cost, right? So what if you can somehow take this data and store it somewhere else and keep, save this 80%? So this is the whole philosophy, not just behind EIB uh, 4448, uh, like it's also Eigen DA and mm. Celestia. All of them have the same exact goal. Let's put this data somewhere else. And the design choices are different. So EigenDA says you can do this today through EigenDA and do use restaking. So the same Ethereum you're using for restaking will be used to secure the data. So this one design. The other design, Celestia, says, no, no, you can give us this data for you to skip and you will pay us our using our own token. So crypto economic security. So that's one. The third way that... Uh, as Dimitri mentioned, like you can just store it in AWS. Like who cares, right? Like put it in a Validium, put the data on AWS. Um, Ethereum, um, like data blobs concept is that you will create this data space as a separate or a side blocky chain to Ethereum that only focusing in data. It will not do execution. It will just do data. So it is the same concept as EigenDA, but it's a kind of Ethereum foundation sponsored. <laughs> it's, it's a part of the, Part of the process, yeah. I thought uh, dang sharding was more for like temporary memory or temporary data, whereas like uh, Egan DA uh, and others are more long-term data. Is that true or no? Okay. Uh, so what do you mean by temporary data? Like a RAM. Like, okay. you know, like it will flush out and, you know, at a certain time period, it will flush out and people can continue storing data within Ethereum. To some extent, yes. Dimitri, you can add more color into, into that, but we have two concepts of memory on any node. Yeah. State, which is like the, the active data, your account balance, my account balance at the exact moment, and your historical data. Let's put the historical data to the side. The idea of data blocks is that when you transact on a rollup, after a bit, after two weeks or so, your state doesn't matter anymore. You don't need to keep the data availability anymore. Because the data probably has progressed and you can go to archival nodes to get this data. So yes, the data blobs concept that you will save the data for some time. And then after two weeks or a month or whatever amount they decide on, the, the older state will disappear, but you're still keeping the current state. Uh, Dimitri, do you agree? I think that conceptually makes sense. I think also it just goes back to Chell's question around complexity, where there's different flavors of doing this. I think it ultimately comes down to to what extent does this benefit end users or application developers? It, it's largely a question of cost from one perspective. It, if it is significantly cheaper for devs or users, then, then it might be worth actually going through and implementing this design pattern. I kind of think about it as, you know, if, if, if you want to build a car, like the usual analogy when, when building a startup, like, you know, do like the wheels and then the chassis and then the steering wheel. You start with a scooter and then a bicycle and then a car, you know, and, and I think these DA constructions are finding ways to, to potentially reduce transaction costs. I don't know which flavor is going to be preferred, but I, 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 I like the idea of for a startup or like an application developer when thinking about which DA solution to choose from, what pain points are they trying to solve for? And then what additional complexity are they taking on? And if the cost benefit or the security 
benefit is worth it, yeah, maybe you uh, you should opt in for the complexity. It almost feels like at some point uh, there needs to be a AWS type of product for developers where you have a nice front end that gives you a few options to choose from as a developer. You can choose which DA, for example, the Ethereum Foundation uh, version of DA <laughs> or the Celestia or Eigenlayer, yeah. etc. Yeah, and, and then there's another option for uh, another like drop down, mm-hmm. literally a drop down on the UX for like which uh, rollup, like is it an optimi- optimistic rollup or a zk rollup or something else. And, and that's the whole idea behind Caldera, for example, that you guys invested also went through our program. So moving from data availability to to the rollup side of things. Uh, what what is the current landscape that, that you're seeing? Because there, there's obviously Arbitrum, Optimism, a bunch of app chain rollups, and then there's Share Sequencer, a lot of complexity, a lot of names. What, what, what's the landscape? I think in general, we're kind of seeing the usual suspects around Arbitrum, Optimism, ZK Sync, Starkware that have their flavors of either Optimistic or ZK. I think there is some interesting ideas around how L3s might look like, both on Starkware and the hyperchains that ZK Sync is working on. Uh, you can conceptually do an L3 on top of an optimistic rollup. I think Arbitrum has been working on that. I believe they call it Orbit. Mm-hmm. I think the, these are very cool constructions. I like the idea of giving developers the opportunity to have their own block space. It feels like a lot of applications are exploring that right now. Most are probably still on a lot of these monolithic L2s, I'll call them, because of user eyeballs effectively, liquidity. Uh, I think to have a vibrant application-specific L2 ecosystem or L3 ecosystem, you probably need to solve for things like bridging and cross rollup atomicity. And that's where a lot of the ideas around shared sequencers come in. Most of these rollups today, I mean, I think all of them today is single sequencer. And part of the exploration that's happened in, in the last year is, well, what if we decentralize the sequencer? Or, or, or what are even the issues here? And, and a lot of folks are saying, okay, well, censorship resistance is an issue. Liveness is an issue. What if someone finds where Arbitrum's single node is and they blow up the data center, people would not be happy. So do you need to build in some redundancy in the system? And then I think a lot of the thought evolved and said, okay, well, is there really a benefit to decentralizing a single rollup? Maybe Uh, you could have some very vanilla flavor of like round robin where you have, uh, I don't know, like some I don't even know if you need it to uh, uh, to be stake weight, but having multiple options to actually settle to L1, but you don't solve a lot of the issues around bridging and uh, and cross rollup communication and the notion of shared sequencers is, is probably r- relatively more novel. It's it, it's it, it's the idea of can you split? I suppose transaction ordering from transaction execution. So so introducing another layer of modularity with the benefit of if you do have a, um, a shared sequencer set that is providing ordering for multiple rollups, um, what can you do there? The cool benefit there, and it might be the most clear benefit is that bridging and atomic composability become slightly easier. It, it almost comes for free if you have a fully overlapping shared sequencer set. So I, I think it's a very interesting direction, like things that Astria, Espresso, Radius are working on. Dimitri, I, I probably have like 10 questions from the last two minutes. <laughs> and some of, them are for my, some of them are for myself and others are for the audience. I think this requires going back to the basics of yeah. defining what is, for example, L3, L2, what is atomicity, yep. at atomic composability? And bridging and etc. But let's start with the first one. Uh, you mentioned L3 and L2. What is exactly an L3? This is actually a question for me. What is what is exactly L3? And why would you, as a developer, do an L3 versus doing a L2 app chain? Yeah. So that is still up in the air. Um, I think all layers are blockchains. They're just blockchains with two-way trust-minimized bridges. Is the way I frame it. And 
what L2s do is they post their their uh, state, to, you know, like their settlement transaction to L1. The L3 design pattern posts that to the L2. For the ZK variant, you would have the L3 post the validity proof to the L2. And then that is recursed into the validity proof down to L1. For optimistic, it's a bit cloudier, where I suppose you you have the state route posted to L2, and then that's posted to L1. I see a bit less of a benefit there because the L3 security on an optimistic rollup still falls back to the fraud proof window for the L2 going back to L1. So I, I'm not sure you get much of a security benefit there. I think the ZK variant with recursion is a bit more interesting. Why someone would do it, I think ultimately it's around customizability and somewhat business model potentially to have their own token, uh, for example, used as the gas token. I think that's often interesting for, for teams. I think this is also a good opportunity for the reemergence of enterprise blockchain, but they could actually be their own L2s or L3s. It gives you access to the L2 liquidity and and user base, and it makes bridging easier amongst the different L3s. Is this like a similar thesis to Base, where um, Base is you know developing their own like chain within the optimistic bedrock framework, and they're bringing their own users into this like kind of permission KYC chain, but that's yeah. ultimately bringing in a whole new set of users that wouldn't have been able to come before. Is that how you're thinking about it? But Base is an L2. Base is still an L2. Say it again? Base, Base is an L2. Base, That's right. It's still an L2. Right. Uh, I think L3 is more complex, kind of. Uh, it's a kind of replicating what is happening between L2 and L1, another level up. So L3 to L2. But uh, there's actually a very nice distinction here that was actually commented really well or captured really well by Vitalik himself. When he said like, Actually, LS3 currently feels like a marketing term. Everyone is saying, I'm yeah. building as an LS3, which is that, definitely... That's what is. I feel too. The same. You know why? You know why? Because <laughs> the data availability. Like, it's the funny the funny thing that it's a marketing term because exactly the terms that we have been discussing since the beginning, which is data availability, right? If you are rolling the data from the LS3 to the L2, and then the L2 is rolling its data back to the L1, then the L3 data is rolled back all the way to the L1. So you are paying the exact same cost. So you cannot have actually like any saving or any advantage actually of building an L3. So I define L3 in a funny way. I call it, uh, I think Chow had I had discussion with you before. The true L3 and the fake L3. The true L3 that ends its relation with life to the L2. Like the data availability is only posted to the L2. End of the story. It, it's not rolled down to the L1. Then yes, it depends on the security assumption of the L2 to live. So it it's a layer on top of L2. The fake L3, which actually what people say right now is that, yeah, we will just build on top of Starkware or maybe ZK Sync or Arbitrum as an L3. But essentially, our data still will live on the L1. So it's actually an L2 that is marketed as L3 for, for the community to give them some grant or something. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. There, 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 there might be some cases where it makes sense. If you have, for example, an application-specific L2 that is a certain gaming ecosystem, mm-hmm. that what you might have is potentially L3s with their own games that potentially leverage the IP of the L2, and those games can have their own economies, but then they use that L2 as some like connectivity back down. That is largely theoretical. Like a communications layer. Communications layer, shared liquidity and intraop layer, but yeah, it's definitely still in the idea maze to actually figure out like where this makes most sense. To your question on atomicity, it's an all or none transaction. So, so either you execute both things or multiple things, it could be a chain. And if any one of those fail, then everything reverts. This is particularly important in DeFi, particularly around liquidations, atomic, uh, well, flash loans are a feature that you get from atomicity. It's fascinating because you can effectively have infinite leverage with zero credit risk, I suppose. So so it's a really important concept around keeping the DeFi ecosystem kind of balanced. Across different rollups, you can have composability, meaning you, you can interact 
with different L2s, but you might need either a bridge that goes between the L2s or you go back down to L1 and read one L2 reads the state that was posted to uh, from another L2 to that L1, and then they take an action. But if you wanted to, say, do a flash loan across two different L2s, that's where the notion of atomic composability would be particularly important. Dimitri, can you define atomic composability in the context of rollups? Yeah, so if you have, say you have, in the world where you have Unichain and Maker Chain, and Maker is not a Cosmos chain, it's an L2, and there's uh, a liquidation on maker chain, you would want some actor, uh, some liquidation bot to uh, take the collateral, take it to uh, uni chain, swap it, and then deposit it back to maker chain. And so that all needs to happen atomically. But what does atomically mean exactly? Because on, on the layer one, it means typically means within the same block. Within the same block. Yeah. Yeah. You're, I suppose you're assuming that the different L2s have some alignment between their block times. It's an alignment, I suppose, within the same blocks that are are mine, I suppose, on, on each of the different LTs. And today they're not synced, right? But I don't think so. something like a shared sequencer might potentially enable the syncing? Or Fuda, you're, you're, <laughs> you're like, skeptical. Well, that's what I was going to say. Even if they are synced, atomic composability is not possible. Simply because you need to kind of transfer an asset from the rollup one to rollup two, do an action and transfer the asset back in to the rollup one in one chain, in one block, in one second, in one fight, whatever, whatever time period. This is not going to happen. The security guarantees gets broken. Once you move from one chain to the other, security guarantees is broken. Done. What you can do actually using shared sequencer is ordering transaction. And this has different use cases. It's not liquidations. It's not flash loans. Maybe arbitrage. Uh, and I think we discussed this before. Would this be considered like asynchronous composability? Yes. It's not atomic. Like yeah. we, can, we can call it non-atomic. We can create a new term now, given that we are all here. We yeah. can say non-atomic composability, right? Like So it's a composability in some sense that you can force some order of transactions to be run on different chains. But they are not atomic. You don't, you cannot move assets between these two chains. Unless you have pools of capital sitting. Let's say that you are liquidating something on here and, uh, and on, I will use the same examples that Dimitri gave. Like you are, you have the maker roll up and you have the mini swap roll up. If you have infinite pools of capital on both chains, then you can kind of use this liquidity. But moving the same asset back and forth breaks atomic compatibility for sure. Okay. So for audience. How does a share sequencer work? Okay. Actually, what, what, what is the goal of it? So first of all, what is the problem that, that it's trying to solve and, and to how does it solve it? Liveness and censorship resistance is what I hear about the most around. Again, if you have a single sequencer, it is fairly non-trivial for that sequencer to censor your transactions. That mm -hmm. sequencer can go offline and so then all the users on the L2 are forced to do a manual exit back to L1. They, they could do it, but I can imagine the UX for that is probably pretty awful. So ideally, you, you want to reduce, it, I, I suppose, the possibility of that happening. There can be other ways of doing it, I suppose. For a given L2, you can always checkpoint back to the last commitment to L1. So maybe you can have another L2 sequencer that is spun up uh, that, that effectively like restarts state from, from the last checkpoint. But the sequencer bridge admin keys or, or like multi-sig keys are probably still going to be controlled by a single entity. So that still gets difficult, I suppose. Yeah, the idea of a shared sequencer is to split the notion of ordering and execution, you can still have a single rollup operator do the state transition and then post that state tr uh, transition down to L1, but it's not focused on the actual transaction ordering. That can be a separate group of, of nodes effectively that, uh, that do it. And yeah, I think, like I mentioned before, like the nice thing that you get for free is 
because that ordering layer can touch multiple rollups. It can give soft guarantees of, of inclusion across different rollups, and it can also effectively act as a bridging mechanism between those different rollups. Food and curious yeah. about it. Mistake. Like actually, like when you were talking, I remember the recent tweet from Kyle Samani when he was actually speaking about a different kind of shared sequencers, which like, he called it centralized shared sequencer, <laughs> which is like exactly that. It's like you have a single sequencer, but instead of this single centralized sequencer, and in, but instead of it operating only on one rollup, it's operating on multiple rollups. And this is I would the the, the discussion was around. How would we progress to the to the things that you were describing, Dimitri, which is decentralized shared sequencing, something like Astria or Espresso or or Radius, when you have actually a network operating as a sequencer, right? So this kind of be a decentralized shared sequencer. But there is actually people now actually thinking of can we actually to enable composability between some kind of composability, obviously between different chains, by just making it a shared sequencer. That is centralized in everything, but it's like shared. So this is what like came into my head and made me laugh because like people are trying to go for the easiest solution possible to solve the problem, which is like, oh, we are breaking composability by having multiple rollups. So let's solve it by having a sequencer layer that is shared, but it's still centralized. So we didn't like it's just not they are not focused on decentralization anymore. So this is just kind of funny. Okay, but but from my understanding of what you guys described, Dimitri and Fuda, there's actually two problems. One is breaking the composability of having too many rollups, and the other one is decentralization, which currently is not the case because they all use one centralized sequencer. So these are two distinct problems that may be solved with a decentralized shared sequencer network. But the problem of decentralization isn't conceptually the, the easiest solution that the rollup just recruits more sequencers rather than talking to a decentralized sequencer network. Like, wh- why can't Arbitrum just recruit their, their own sequencers as opposed to creating a new Astria or, or Express or, or whatever? It will not solve the composability, essentially. Like, they can have, right. they can decentralize sequencer and be happy, but they will not solve the composability issue. Correct. But if I, if I were Arbitrum, my incentive, my goal is to be the only rollup <laughs> That wins everything. I don't care about composability. I, I actually want Arbitrum, or I actually want Optimism to lose so that they become irrelevant and then their composability doesn't matter in the first place. Yes, but they will still need a central, like, okay, not a, they will need a share, shared sequencers for all the rollups that use their tech stack. That's what the Optimism super chain is all about. Optimism yep. now is not a single chain. And Arbitrum is actually moving in the same direction. They said, we will open our tech stack for anyone to use. And we, you know what? We will give you even Arb tokens as a grant to build another L2 in our ecosystem. So Arbitrum and Optimism now is moving in the same direction. They want to have many rollups within their ecosystem. That's and right. for the com- for composability between this sub rollups or whatever, you still need a short sequencer. It, <laughs> it's a must. But the difference yeah. is it's the RB, for example, like shared sequencer or yes. uh, the OP Labs one that is operating across all of the rollups that are building within their ecosystems. Exactly. And, and Chow, what you're referring to is like an incentive misalignment problem or, or an incentive alignment problem where the walled gardens are being recreated. Not not full wall gardens, but it seems like there's not a an incentive to actually achieve atomic composability between different rollups because you actually want, you know, well, you know, keep DeFi on Arby because you're you're That's able right. to have yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. That's why I'm a bit torn on the I don't want to say like viability, but but go to market I think is going to be interesting um, on this. And and it again this goes back to complexity like to what extent do you need to decentralize everything? Like go back to your 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 end users, like like which persona actually needs these properties today? Maybe there there, there is enough of in ecosystem within a certain uh, rollup that they have less of a need for that. So so are you creating 
a solution for, for a problem that doesn't exist there today. You know, I think like applications are probably more concerned with low fees, higher throughput, predictable gas costs, interesting like business model ideas around introducing uh, pre-compiles that have not been included in ETH L1 yet that enables their user base or use cases to do novel things. I feel like that's more important today than actually figuring out a way to solve for the theoretical of liveness and censorship resistance. That's probably more of a contentious statement that, that you know, I might get some, some DMs on later, but I think it's like an order of operations. A follow-up question. Um, I feel like the two of you send me very mixed signals. And in fact, Fuda, you said a couple of things earlier that are seemingly conflicting. Okay. And it's probably just me misunderstanding you guys. But it seems to me that, Dimitri, you think atomic composability is possible, and Fuda, you think that it's not possible. But my understanding of what you just did, described as shared sequencer, if you have a shared sequencer node that is used by both Arbitrum and Optimism that handles the consensus and transaction ordering of both, why is atomic composability not possible? Like, I'm probably just misunderstanding this, but I want to get to the bottom. Let's of clarify this. first your statement. Uh, Dimitri, do you believe that atomic composability is possible using shared sequences? Yes. Okay. I, 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 I am the opposite camp then. Like, I don't believe that atomic composability is possible. So you got this chap right away, chap. So okay. I can explain my reasoning and I kind of did, but atomic composability for me means that you can take a flash loan for an application move this flash loan, take take a million USDC from one chain, move this one US, million USDC to another chain, do something with this one million USDC, then get whatever, do arbitrage, move back the one USDC to the first application. So you can do this now on Ethereum L1, and you can do it in one transaction, not even one, one transaction. You run a smart contract that has all these transactions, and all of this happens and done, voila, right? So this is possible because of two things, because you have the ability to order transactions. This is the fact that you have a smart contract that contains these transactions in order. This is one. The second one is that you have liquidity. You can move this liquidity within the same blockchain. Your state is known to every player, to every validator, right? Maybe we can add a third one that Watch the ad- definition of atomic. If any of these transaction fail, then all of the smart contracts will revert and you don't lose any money. So let's take these three as some properties and examine them again in the case of two different rollups with a shared sequencer. So we're assuming they have a shared sequencer. So you can take flash loan from, from an rollup one. You want to move this liquidity to the rollup two. Can you do this in the same clock, in the same transaction as executing the transaction, I don't think it's possible today that you do a transfer of asset between the federal ups and do, thing, do things in that and go back. So today, for the foreseeable future, I don't think it's possible. The other part that is breaking the atomic composability for me is that you can do some of that, but if the last step failed, you have no guarantee whatsoever to revert everything. Whatever has happened, has happened. <laughs> you need just to be so can the short sequencer guarantee that? I doubt it. Yes, they, like they can order transaction, but who knows, right? So it's interesting. Can you do that if, for example, you have two different rollups which share the same sequencer set with a rule base that each, so, so they all have access to the same mempool. They all have their own, uh, they, uh, they have each other's state transition function in the logic and there uh, is inclusion criteria there, meaning you uh, you need to have one to go through in order for uh, for the other to execute within like the shared sequencer logic. Yeah, but now you recoupled like the shared sequencer, you, we started by this is that shared sequencer separates execution from ordering, right? Now, what you said now is exactly recoupling both, recoupling consensus to execution, that if this doesn't execute, then consensus have to fail, kind of, right? Or like you cannot proceed. So the idea of shared sequencer that you take this ordering piece, put it aside and separate it from consensus. We don't need or settle. 
yes, it can, in, in the way you describe it, it can, it's possible, but you kind of walk, walk back on the first assumption, which is like, now you cannot, you cannot progress in the chain unless you do what the short sequence have told you to do. So something like that. So it's a kind of tricky. I, I, I'm sure like there is people in this space way smarter than me and they will figure out how to do it. But as of now, with my limited knowledge, I don't see it happening in the next couple of years. Maybe talking more about the shared sequencers, unless uh, is there any follow up to this? Yeah, uh, I think, I think <laughs> I was uh, enjoying like, uh, like, <laughs> Like <laughs> the debate, what do you mean conflict was debated? Go, go ahead, Chia. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, go I ahead. do have I do have a follow up question, uh, which ahead. is uh, a direct result of your disagreement, which is bridging. Mm -hmm. So you two disagree on, on whether or not atomic composability is possible today. So then the the natural question is, what is the ideal bridge across rollups in several dimensions in terms of composability, in terms of fees in terms of latency. These are the things I think are the most important factors for the end users. This is a question that I have not been able to, to answer myself. What is the future of cross roll-up bridges? To your uh, point on atomic composability, also like I don't think it's possible today. I guess I was more saying there might be ways to do it uh, in the future, but I think these constructions are still in progress. So still TBD for uh, for quite some time. Um, I've been thinking about bridging in the context of L2s for um, for quite some time. I think within a given L2 ecosystem, there might be less of a need for a third party bridge. I think a lot of these L2 ecosystems between their rollups and potentially L3s, they will probably use homegrown messaging systems. I think. That's probably the safest for them. We've seen this in other areas like Avalanche, like rolled out their own messaging system, um, obviously like IBC. I think you can have ways to use a L2, say different L2s can read from the fraud proof or, uh, or validity proof that's posted to the L1 and then use the DA as the bridging mechanism where one L2 can check the fraud proof against the state root on some DA and say, okay, this is valid. And so that L2 takes an action on their side. So, so two different L2s can use L1 to bridge and then different L3s can use the L2 as effectively the, the, the sum of layer. Where it becomes harder is if you're going across different L2 or L3 ecosystems or if you're going across chains. I think you for sure need a third party bridge if you are going like off ETH L1. That's unavoidable for anything else. And and then you have all of your flavors of like transport verification layers that do that. But I think a realization for me relatively recently is that within a certain L2 ecosystem, you probably might not need a third party bridge as as much as we thought. There can be use cases where you can have operators front liquidity between two different L2s on the liquidity layer, but on the transport and verification layer, I think that could happen without a third party bridge. I will have a follow up question to this one. So like, do you think the IBC style bridges is like, is a way to go for like inter roll up uh, bridges or like what would be the ideal bridge between different roll ups? Well, let's say, Ethereum rollups. You need finality for IBC. So, mm -hmm. so it's hard on, I mean, like you'll have a finality gadget, but that'll give, you know, that'll give you some baseline. It was like every 50 blocks or something. Mm -hmm. So that's like the fastest, I suppose that in IBC type con uh, construction would work. I guess that's like to uh, Imran's point in the beginning, like what did Cosmos do better? It baked in interop from day one. I don't think that EF has any roadmap to to think about ecosystem-wide interop. Um, ideally, there would be standards on this, but I think they've just kind of left it to roll up teams to figure it out by themselves. And I think that's why you have this like mush of like like dozens of projects that are trying to do it on their own. I think that's yeah, still like an, an Ethereum problem that has not been solved. Okay. I want to go back to the shared sequencer topic specifically around 
like right now you have centralized sequencers that are ran by, you know, layer twos. Arbitrum runs one, Optimism runs one. What is a path to decentralization? So an example is like you mentioned Austria and, and Espresso, right? Are the two decentralized sequencer networks. What do you think is their go-to-market strategy? How do you think they're going to, one, get alignment with those like layer twos? And then how do you think about deploying additional sequencers in a way that's composable with all the layer twos that are out there? I think it's hard. I think if Arbitrum wants to decentralize, I think they... Uh... Sorry, is it opt-in as well? Or is it something that they can do on their own? Or do they have to, do they have to get alignment with those layer twos? I assume it, uh, it would be opt-in. You know, I think the thing that would push them, like really push them is some regulatory pushback. You know, I think like like that's going to be a concern, you know, like, are you considered a money transmitter if you're running a single sequencer? Like, oh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, you know, like, how does the CFTC look at you if you are um, app specific L2 that's running a perp dex? You know, like, 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 should you be sharding the order book? amongst a sequencer set that's basically i mean it is a benefit to dydx on cosmos that that order book is distributed you know you can't do that on an eth l2 unless you decentralize the sequencer which is i guess different from having a shared sequencer but i think that that would be in my opinion the thing that leads them to want to do this sooner rather than than later so within a given ecosystem. I can imagine RV is like working on this. I presented this last year on some like prelim- preliminary ideas. I don't think you, you need it to be stake weight. I think just like simple round robin around who, who gets to post L1, they capture MEV fees. There's some business model there. It becomes harder if you're trying to say, hey, RB sequencer go also order transactions from optimism rollups. I don't know how they make friends with each other there. So primarily you think it's going to be a regulatory push. I, it could also be community push. Um, I know right now Arbitrum makes quite a lot of money from running a centralized sequencer whereby they give that back to the community or some portion of the fees back to the community or they put in a DAO where they reinvest back into the community. I'll be very curious to see how that actually plays out in the long run, especially if you have these shared centralized sequencers, they have to one, try to get opt-in from those networks or those layer twos. And then over time, they have to decentralize in a way that it forces some sort of composability or asynchronous composability between the different layer two networks. So like, let's say Austria and and, and, and the others were able to get opt-in from, let's say, Optimism, Arbitrum and others, and they run these decentralized sequencers. The question that I would have is like, one, who's running the centralized sequencers or decentralized sequencers within Austria and Espresso? Like, what, how does that look like and how does that work? Are they really decentralized or are they running in the back end? Like, I'm curious on like, how are they doing that today? And then if that was to happen, then would this create this like kind of shared composability network where they're able to like do maybe not composable transactions, but some sort of asynchronous composability? Yeah, I mean, the, like that feels nice to think about um, from an ecosystem perspective. I have not dug into Astria or Espresso okay. enough to understand implementation-wise who runs it, whether it's like a permission set or a whitelisted set or, or if it's fully permissionless. I can imagine it's probably easier to just have whitelisted parties in the beginning and minimum viable, you know, like start with five to 30 and then see how uh, how far you get there. You, you you probably need to offer some benefit to, uh, you know, if it's like RB Foundation and OP Foundation that are, you know, running for each other, like why would they participate? I can imagine the uh, uh, the community argument, but I don't know. Like I have not spoken to, to anyone there, so I don't want to speak out. I read a little bit about Astria and Espresso, and I think it's a kind of... Uh... They have a network of con- sequencers and they kind of randomly select which sequencer will sequence the next block over different chains. So it depends on uh, VDFs, variable delay functions, that you have to stake the token of the network and then based on how much you stake, you will get a number of slots and like, but you don't know which slots you will get uh, beforehand. You will have to run VDFs to know the slot. And VDFs are. Yeah, it's a consensus problem, as yeah. any consensus problem. The advantage is that it's a simpler one. You just need to pick one from a pool. 
So you don't re, you don't execute anything. You don't get consensus on execution. You just okay. I have ten. I want to pick one of ten randomly. So they this, this shared sequencers network actually do consensus. There is no way around it. But <laughs> uh, but it's a random one and a simpler one. Right, because espresso has a variant of hot stuff. So yes, they, uh, they use that, and then the VDF is for the selection of who ac- executes it at the end, or is, is that VDF based? To select, like, like if we are ten sequencers who are participating, like who of us will be doing the next block or next order, this is where the VDFs come in to select one of us uh, to take this slot. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. I have done a lot of discussion in short sequencer. It's a, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very, like it's a very interesting topic. Uh, like it is. we we focused on this one a lot. So I think uh, you know we can touch on well. Um, yeah, sorry, I was gonna say yeah. we, we we have three options now, at least three. We can either branch from a shared sequencer into MEV on layer two, which is a <laughs> whole interesting topic of its own, <laughs> or we can talk about eigenlayer, which may be related to everything we've talked about so far, or we can also talk about Cosmos. Uh, I know Dimitri has a lot of thoughts and strong opinions about Cosmos, and so do we. <laughs> We well, do, yeah. What do you guys want to talk about? I mean, Cosmos oh, makes the most sense, but <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think yeah, yeah. For Cosmos, I suppose the you know I've been trying to figure out where you compete as like a Cosmos chain, and if you're trying to be a sediment layer for DeFi, it's really tough to compete with ETH as a sediment layer, and if you're trying to be a gaming chain, it's really tough to compete with the culture or like uh, maybe the BD rather on like Polygon. And then if you're trying to do like art and NFTs and PFPs, it's really hard to compete with the culture on ETH. And so I feel like a lot of that, and if you're trying to do um, uh, interesting uh, things at the base layer side, um, you know, Edmos had this really cool like flavor of 1559 where a portion of the gas fees burned would go to the uh, uh, the developers. Canto has some interesting like public good stuff there. I would argue a lot of that can be pre-compiles on L2s. So a lot of the features which you're building an entire chain for and paying um, a ton for security can just be a feature on ideally an L2 with a decentralized sequencer set. Like that probably gets you very close to Cosmos, but you still get the benefits of having ecosystem, cultural alignment, liquidity alignment. I think where it probably does make sense is if you truly need a very high degree of customization that you cannot get. I mean, again, like we don't have decentralized sequencer sets or sequencer or uh, or shared sequencers live. This is like all conceptual, you know, but you can bake that into like the Tendermint SDK support set out of the box. So if you actually need that today, that's probably a good option for you. So I almost view it as an order of operations around where teams launch. And uh, historically, they've launched on ETH L1. I think now we're seeing that flip a bit and teams are launching on L2s first as a go-to-market. I've seen them launch on other EVMs. Uh, in some cases, like GMX actually started on BSC. I didn't know that until very recently. So you can have migrations. And I think once you get to a place where maybe you, you've you outgrown the capabilities, but you need these capabilities for a better experience for your end users, then maybe it makes sense to, to, to have your own Cosmos chain. So, so I think it will make sense potentially for more teams over time assuming those applications grow to scale where um, where they need it. But there's a tension there between having that ability on a Cosmos chain and potentially L2s having that ability through pre-compiles and, and decentralizing sequences. Dimitri, I, I want to touch on the, the three verticals that, that you, you, you talked about at the beginning. How does Cosmos compete with in DeFi, in gaming, and in NFTs? So uh, NFTs, I strongly agree with you. The culture is something that Cosmos simply cannot compete with, Ethereum, culture-wise, or even Solana. Solana and Ethereum both both have a very strong NFT culture. And culture itself, it has very strong network effect. That's very hard to Cosmos to, to overcome. DeFi, I think, for the most part, I agree with you. We know for a fact that many 
blue chip DeFi protocols are looking to launch their own app chain and they want to do so on an Ethereum rollup as their own app chain as opposed to a Cosmos zone. This is the thing that really pushed me to change my mind on Cosmos in the last like six months. Over the last six months, Cosmos is the only thing that I had a 180. Six months ago, we, we did an episode where we, uh, th- that was when uh, they published the Cosmos 2.0 vision. Imran, remember that? Yeah. We were extremely bullish. And then recently, the, the move of Ethereum blue chip DeFi protocols onto, onto uh, their, their roll-up app chains is causing me to not feel bearish on Cosmos, but certainly feel that Cosmos is feeling a, a huge threat. It's facing a huge threat from Ethereum in DeFi. Could we dive a little bit deeper on the DeFi side? I can't share the names, but... No, no, no. What I mean is like, uh, there's some comments that I have uh, yeah. re- specifically regarding DeFi. Yeah, go um, ahead. There's a set of like pros and cons, right? For for Cosmos and Ethereum, right? Dimitri mentioned pre-compile, right? So like getting a, some subsidized, some smart contract computation and then being able to allow some sort of like apps being able to run that's cheaply ran versus like, let's say on a layer one. Similarly, with Cosmos, you could kind of do the same thing, right? There are some advantages to running on Cosmos, such as uh, if you think about like threshold encryption, or if you think about like like DYDX order matching engine that's on the validator set, and then using its own like uh, currency uh, as a way to find value in in the sense of what the the token can do. And so, I do think there's some advantages. Like if you look at what DYDX is doing, you know, th- there's a reason why they moved. From, you know, they could have done an app chain, but they ended up doing their own Cosmos chain. So I guess the curious, what I'm curious more about is what, what like pushed them to do that move? Imran, you, you tried UIDX after they moved to Cosmos, right? The, the, you tried the product. I have not. No, the, I've, so I've, I've not. only used it on Starkware. Um, okay. But I have not I'm, used it. Uh, I I'm think just they went, curious. Yeah. I'm just curious, what wallets do you, you actually need to use DYDX on Cosmos? Do you have to use Kepler or can you use MetaMask? Because the thing that, that really boggles my mind about this DYDX decision is once they've moved to Cosmos, they, they basically have a, a much smaller user base that, that already have a uh, wallet installed. Assuming they, you have to use a Cosmos first wallet like Kepler instead of uh, MetaMask. Um, yeah. But I, I haven't tried the product either. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. Like, I mean, rollups, people generally use like L2 and L3s or whatever you want to call it as a way to scale. But then if you want more customizability, then you want to do your own zone, right? Uh, for now, like, well, like my understanding, yeah. they, they, they move for three reasons, uh, uh, maybe two. One, I think it was difficult for them to build um, uh, in uh, Cairo, pretty painful. Right. The second is that potentially a regulatory thing around sharding the order book. And then a third, I think, is a pretty natural business model for the market makers who each run that order book where you kind of get like round robin MEV, where I think those market makers can potentially have a more like crypto native business model through transaction ordering. And and you can potentially keep, you potentially don't need to ever even turn on a fee switch if you're able to capture fees through MEV. So those are, in my head, what the three reasons are. And I think, again, today they did need to do that because you cannot do that on any ETH L2 because we still have no idea how to fully decentralize a sequencer on ETH L2. But maybe that will change within the next year or two. I also thought that uh, the reason why DYDX moved was because of the open source nature of the Cosmos SDK. There's just a lot of... Uh, flexibility and, you know, ways to kind of communicate with the rest of the open source community around how they should be building their product. Yeah, I, I think uh, the DYDX decision actually came at a timing that at this exact moment of time when they launched, when they announced it a year ago, roughly, like, yes, Cosmos Zone gave you a lot of custom, custom, customizability that is not was impossible as an L2. And uh, to some extent, not possible today is still an L2. But a year after that, actually, like many of the options that we were this, that forced DYDX to do this transition, maybe except for the MEV round robin part that Dimitri was speaking, are actually happening on the L2. And let me take that because this is some of the interesting stuff that is happening due to modularity. So far, like either you 
on in as an into either you use EVM and you write Solidity code or you have to go and to start where and write Kyo, right? So this was your options a year back. Actually, now I'm seeing so many projects using an L2 with a custom execution environment. You can write WASM, you can write Trust, you can write whatever language you can want and compile it to and use it as an L2. So this wasn't possible before. Mm -hmm. So the, the developer experience that wasn't possible before as an L2 is, can be possible. Now, what enabled this, Fura? The separation between execution and consensus that was enabled by optimism, ah. tweaking yeah. their bedrock infrastructure to separate execution from consensus. So you don't need mm. the EVM, you, you separate go get, like, or get the execution engine from the consensus. So you can replace get with anything else. You can replace, you can, so you can use any state machine, essentially. Mm -hmm. And, and we're seeing new projects. And that's as it compiles down to MIPS. Or uh, or wasm. Suppose it then can it can it can compile up to anything. Once you have a state, you just push the state on the L1. Done. It's like you can do whatever it is. We are seeing people trying to bring Solana virtual machine on top of Ethereum as an L2. Well, I'm seeing so many teams building wasm. I'm seeing even projects that say we you can build build a state machine using any language. So this flexibility is interesting. And actually, these are not production ready, right? Most of these are still work in progress. Uh, are there actually any developers who, who's actually writing non-solidity on top? Well, uh, aside from Carol, uh, and but Cosmos wasn't ready also to run arbitrary code. Like Cosmosm is very new. Like right, yeah. and uh, unless you but, but be, you Cosm Wasm was two years ago, right? It was not that new. About a year ago, I think it was but a year ago. It came into production ready environment. It was under development for the last two years. Okay. So I think DYDX moved because they would intend it to bake their code in the, in the node validator code. So like as a pre-compile, like you don't need to write a smart contract. You just write your code as part of the node code. So that mm. was possible before in Cosmos. That was impossible in, as an L2. But I foresee that within a year or so, this will be possible. You can write whatever code you want as an L2 and you can run it. And mm -hmm. this will take one big advantage from the Cosmos ecosystem back to the L2. And I think many people... Which is what Cosmos that. has as an advantage, right? Yeah. And Imran, yeah. I think you I think you mentioned that tweet that the Cosmos people are seeing that as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, there was a tweet um, Zaki tweeted a couple weeks ago. I don't have it in front of me, but pretty much said that they have about 12 months. I have it. Yeah, why don't you read it? <laughs> Here's Zaki's tweet. I think Cosmos social capital has about 12 months to do something unique and differentiated. Otherwise, we get swallowed by ETH-flavored variants of Cosmos-originated ideas like roll-ups and eigenlayer. I feel intense urgency. The hour is late. Well, that sounds kind of scary, man. <laughs> when I saw that, I was, I was really shocked because Zaki is like, what, top, top three, at least top 10 people in, in Cosmos? He's yeah. one of the co-founders of Cosmos. Is he a co-founder or? I, I thought he was, yeah. He was one of the uh, leader, lead developers in the Cosmos. Oh, uh, okay. Early on. Yeah. Today, he's certainly the top five people in the Cosmos like ecosystem. And when I saw this, I was, I was pretty shocked. But the funny thing is, we, we actually independently came to this conclusion before he tweeted this from our last few episodes. Like we talked about this several times already, that, that Cosmos is facing a huge threat from, from uh, Ethereum. And... But interestingly, also interestingly, this is a bit of history, but it seems like arguably Cosmos is, is the OG or really the, the creator, the inventor of modular architecture yep. with all these various independent Cosmos zones. Of course, I mean, I know you're rolling your eyes already, but... <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a different kind of modularity. Like, I yes. like if you ask any developer, why, why do they love Cosmos SDK? It's because the modularity of the SDK, the tendermint consensus engine is separate from the IPC consensus engine, it's separate from the execution engine. So the modularity was actually baked in, in the SDK. So you can take the same yep. SDK and build whatever with it. So it's a different kind of modularity. It's not just yeah. taking modularity, but modularity within the SDK. It was great, actually. And I they are, yeah, I agree, they are the OGs. <laughs> That's like vertical modularity instead of like horizontal. So yes. Yeah. That really begs the question because of, of like, does the first mover advantage really, well, I guess, 
okay, it's, it's very arguable who's the first mover, but Cosmos is certainly the first mover in the modular architecture. Cosmos and Polkadot, both of them actually, uh, started in the, in the 2017-18 bear market. And then Ethereum later on converged, the vision of Ethereum converged to Cosmos, not the other way around, arguably, again. But Ethereum's network effect is so strong yeah. that all the developers went to Ethereum. Actually, I will argue again is that it's actually Cosmos that is moving to the shared security platform that Ethereum was believing in from day one. Like yeah. Ethereum, is, Cosmos is started with the segregated security. Everyone is responsible, for, every zone is responsible for their own security, right? And I would say the most interesting piece of Atom V2 uh, vision was the interchain security. And now the opposing proposal from Osmosis, which is... Can you explain security. interchain security? Because I think uh, so. there's some new ch- uh, changes. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the latest, which is mesh security. Okay, mesh security is actually an opposing view. And it was led by Osmosis. It doesn't yep. came from the yep. Cosmos Atom Zone. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's a big diversion. Okay, so... Well, but but like, I, I think that's the model they want to go after, go towards now, which is mesh security. You will find some interesting community discussions and I and I, I can I predict as, as a mini civil war around which one is better but let's let's go with that so okay uh, ICS or interchain security is that instead of you as as a new project want building their own cosmos zone and you want instead of you recruiting your own validators to have your own security or segregated security you can just recruit some of atom zone validator the atom validators to validate a new chain and you pay them the inflation reward of your token to this validator. So this kind of centers at, uh, Atom as the hub, as the Cosmos hub. It gets the Cosmos hub as the central security hub for the whole network. And this kind of resembles Ethereum's vision, that like the Ethereum chain, the L1, is the security source for everything else. So the goal here was to accurate value to the Atom holders. So Atom token holders will benefit from being the source of security for every Cosmos zone. So actually it was um, a shift from the direction that Cosmos started for to shared, to shared security. The mesh security is very similar in concept, but instead of everyone going to recruit security, recruit security from the Cosmos hub or the Atom zone, no, we will build collateral, like we build bi-directional relationship. Osmosis yeah. can recruit securities from... Uh, Celestia, for example, and Celestia gets a relationship with uh, Injective, and Injective have a relationship with whoever, right? Evmos or something. And by having this bilateral relationships, we will end up by having a distributed network of security that everyone is secured essentially by everyone. So these are two competing visions, yeah. and you will find people in in the Cosmos community advocating that miss security is the thing, is that is the real goal. Some people will say, you know, ICS is the real thing. So, so that's why I'm expecting some fun dynamics. I kind of get why Osmosis is pushing for this vision because, like, this will accrue value to their token. Whereas yep. the Cosmos, like, core developers, they want to push for the the other vision because that accrues value to the Atom token. Yes, that begs the question about Cosmos, the Cosmos Hub. Like, what what is its role within the uh, entire Cosmos ecosystem? The OG guy. So that is my simple answer. The the Cosmos Hub is the OG guy in the in the Cosmos ecosystem. There's no canonical. I, I mean, the Cosmos Hub is the one where there's the most connectivity and the most liquidity. There's no canonical. It's a Game of Thrones around who gets to be the uh, the de facto Cosmos Hub. But it lost this seat yeah. twice, by the way. I would agree argue that Terra defeated Atom for a while. And yeah. then Osmosis unseated Atom for a while. So Terra collapsed and disappeared. So it's out of the story. Osmosis is still kind of a competitor, <laughs> kind of, to the, to the Game of Thrones game on Cosmos. So we'll see. It's interesting. <laughs> it's a fun reality TV show. <laughs> it is. Dimitri, back to our original uh, analysis of gaming, NFTs, and, and DeFi. So I said I agree with you on NFTs and, and DeFi. I think gaming, it might be a little bit too early to draw a conclusion. I think everything is so experimental. There's no game that actually works. There's some network effect around optimism, like the Zero X Parks part guys, MUD. But, uh, it's, but it's still it's theoretical. Too early to say. Yeah, a lot of stuff that they're building. 
exactly. It's too early to say Cosmos is out of the question. Yeah, on the web point five games, it's probably a question of distribution partners. Where if you do want to bring in traditional game studios, maybe there is a play there around having a really strong game studio just ship crypto enabled games. I don't want to call them crypto native. It's more basic. You know, there's some assets that are on chain but not fully full、uh, full game state. I think what Argus is building is very cool. That's more of probably the Web three flavor. You know, everything fully on chain. I think a lot of that is also around to what extent are you aggregating the the brains that are actually building this? And it's a very different concept and 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 mental model of yeah what what a fully on chain game is and 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 what the notion of an autonomous world is and. There, I mean, also still competing, you know, against yeah, Mud on Optimism, Dojo on on on, on Starknet, two very interesting frameworks, and then where are the builders, and 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 how do you get the attention of the people who are crypto native? They know how to build these autonomous worlds,、uh, and they are willing and able to do it on an ecosystem outside of an ETH L two, and maybe there are. I guess to your point, it's still in outstanding. Question: It's more of a thing that the Cosmos projects need to prove. Like the burden of proof is on them on whether you can amass enough of the intellectual firepower to to build something、uh, unique and interesting there. Well, sp- speaking of like、uh, Mud, there's also Argus Labs, right?、Uh, that's ran by Scott Sunardo, which is. Building, they're on Cosmos. Yeah, that's right. They're on Cosmos. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't dug deep into what they're building exactly. But taking a quick look at their、um, the Twitter,、um, some sort of EVM based shard. Not sure exactly what that means. I haven't read through it yet. But、uh, for context, they're the the、yeah. uh, the creators of、uh, Dark Forest, which, in my opinion, is the closest thing to giving us a magical moment similar to DeFi Summer. It's not the same at the same level as DeFi Summer, but it's it's it was pretty magical. Yeah. Okay, so they're they're introducing World Engine, which is a sharded rollup SDK built to horizontally scale on-chain games.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah.、Much. I mean, that's been very、um, stealth、uh, about、yeah. this. I think now is being more public. Yeah, sharded rollup with a shared settlement layer, and that settlement layer is probably going to be some Cosmos chain, and、yeah. um, there's probably some customizability there. Probably a game engine that's baked in. I haven't spoken to、uh, to Scott about it. I, I'm not sure what the details are, and the question is. Uh, can you execute that in a standalone Cosmos chain, or can you execute that with an L two? And instead of shards, you have L threes that settle onto that、yeah. L two, and then you bake in custom mud precompiles in every instance. Interesting. Can I get a quick gauge of sentiment? Bullish, neutral, or bearish Cosmos? Because I'm I'm hearing conflicting things again. I, Dimitri, I'm, bullish, I'm bearish. bearish, neutral, bearish. Yeah,、I'm、bearish. Bearish, short term, neutral, long term.、Mm. I'm neutral. Well, isn't? Can you actually be bearish short term than neutral long term? Because so I I kind of agree with Zaki that they have like a twelve month window of opportunity. So if they don't succeed in within the next twelve months by、uh, succeed quote unquote succeed, do they really have another shot at at dethroning Ethereum? Yeah, I guess I'm slightly optimistic of them executing something interesting. But still, not fully convinced that even if they execute, it's going to be powerful enough to actually have some a particularly like long-standing ecosystem or value prop. I don't consider myself an ETH maxi. I'm I'm more like an ETH realist around、uh, you know like like in the context of history you know or like the course of you know years or decades. Like I don't know. Try, try not to fight momentum. You know, just like like lean into where. Things are are heading, and and just try to build on top of that, and and not have like not try to step on each other's toes and build something for end users that will onboard the most retail, the most institutions, because like that's where if we don't get that, like the whole space dies, you know,、yeah. like like that's the my north star around like how do you hundred x the like the users, the liquidity. The developers, the applications, and if if you see 
something has like the most inroads to the, the real world, that's your largest market as an entrepreneur. So like, why do you want to take unnecessary platform risk if you could avoid it? Unless there's a really good reason to. Personally, I don't know what to make of Cosmos, but I'll, I'll, I want to share one counter argument that, that haven't been said to the bare, bearishness of, of towards Cosmos. The, the counter argument is that yesterday, we, uh, Imran and I spoke with a, a founder from Cosmos, and the guy is is uh, just <laughs> I love the guy, um, yeah. a missionary builder and super smart. And uh, the vast majority of the conversation are, revolved around whether or not he's bullish on Cosmos in the long term and why, because that's the biggest risk for any Cosmos builder is the ecosystem wide risk, not the, the product specific risk. And the answer that he gave that I really like is the fact that he said pretty much anyone who has ever written Solidity code and Cosmosm says that Cosmosm is a 10 X better developer experience. And Anecdotally, I heard the same thing from independent sources. I haven't verified myself because I never wrote any code in Cosmosm, so I can't comment on it. But this is a thing that, that I, I've heard a few times now. Also, the community. He mentioned um, that he's uh, he came from the Berkeley like, community and like everyone <laughs> everyone in the Berkeley community is like pro-Cosmos. Even he, the he new people the, that are coming, and and Dimitri, you went to code. <laughs> oh yeah, I would get angry DMs for for, for sure. <laughs> I forgot he, he, he called Cosmos the Berkeley chain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's gonna be painful. Uh, yeah, I guess because because uh, you write. I mean, like like Rust, I think has a nice tailwind because um, uh, it's it, it's 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 used by multiple chains. I would or you know like JavaScript. You know, it's awful, but people use it. There's like a lot of tooling around there. There's a lot of security firms that are working on solutions to make it safer. I think, yeah, if I'm to give maybe an area where also like they could compete, it's around hardware resource provisioning networks. They kind of have like a cosh on there, um, but can you basically have a way to coordinate a lot of machines to provide some compute, storage, GPU, CDN, whatever. And if you do that, then you need a way, well, you by nature have a lot of nodes and you likely need some state machine. You need a way to meter resources based on very specific things that those machines do. I think of like the Jensen's of the world, though though they built on Substrate. I think like you could have that variant be built on Cosmos um, where, where they provide GPUs for um, AI model trading, uh, very computationally expensive, a lot of cost savings that you can get, and not because of the decentralized network itself, the redundancy actually makes it more expensive, but just the supply and demand, just having more machines online that's globally distributed relative to ones that you could stuff inside a single data center. So that's also a, a pretty unique case. Because even if you, I, like, I don't think you could get to L2 sequencer decentralization that is that broad, where if you need like hundreds of nodes, or, like thousands of nodes, that's particularly where you're probably better off with a Cosmos chain. I was listening to one of Sonny's uh, podcasts, and he talked about the differences between Ethereum and, and Cosmos. And one thing he said was um, Cosmos takes an app first approach. And then, whereas maybe Ethereum takes more of an infrastructure first approach. And what does that, and he gave a, a very, he tied it to a very clear example, which is like Google built out search, right? And then from there, they work backwards into figuring out the infrastructure that can continue to help support search. Same thing with Facebook as an example. Then he drew the example to Cosmo and said, like, look, we build up this very modularized infrastructure so that anyone can build any type of app. That's fully customizable to the app level, which Ethereum can do today, all the way today. And that is the edge that, that Cosmos has versus Ethereum. Obviously, Ethereum is starting to converge on the same path. But the question is, like, are they fully there from a parity perspective? And you know, what your thoughts are typically around that thesis? I mean, I, I would ask, like, what burden are you putting on your developer and, and, and what needs do they have? I would argue in in many cases, if you just want to create a monkey PFP, you don't need to have a whole chain for that, you know, or if you just want to create like a marketplace, you probably don't need a full chain. So it probably goes back to the type of application 
Yeah. My sense is there's yeah. a much smaller pool of application devs that are willing to go through that pain of setting everything up. Like launching a network is very difficult. Yeah. And if you are a smart contract dev, maybe you don't want to deal with that. So I think that customizability exists and is useful for devs, but probably not as many as we thought. And a lot probably just want to deploy a smart contract and not worry about how do I bootstrap a validator set? How do I pay for security and worry, oh, if it's reflexive security, how is that going to break my app? You know, I think that's where there's a smaller pool of, of applications where that makes sense. Yeah, I agree with uh, Demetrio on this one. And uh, I, like to, you, to this comment, Imran, I think Cosmos is built to make everything easy, but they missed yeah. the, the part about value capture. Like, where is the value capture in this? Like, don't yeah. create Linux again. Linux is a very versatile tool. Everyone can use it. Everyone can tell. But they didn't figure out a, a value capture mechanism. So Ethereum, in this case, is more similar to Microsoft or Apple. When mm-hmm. they have built, like, it's not, it's still open source and everything, but they have yeah. built something that will keep getting the user back and keeping locking the user. So, and now Microsoft is soloing Linux essentially, right? By WS, by like, by WSL. Yeah. So, like, so I think from a long term perspective, the approach from Ethereum may work better over like 20, 30 years. All right. Well, uh, I know uh, we. This is probably one of our longest recordings. Um, I think this is the longest recording of all the sessions that we've done. And I know we could have kept going on. Um, maybe to close out this conversation, could there be a world where both can coexist? Both, uh, you know, there could be, you know, thousands of mini apps that run on Ethereum and maybe some, you know, larger, you know, you mentioned, Dimitri, like infrastructure heavy apps that could run on. Could there be a, a, like a light at the end of the tunnel for, for Cosmos where they can both coexist. Uh, I'm curious to hear your opinions on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it depends on the, uh, uh, the use case and the market timing. Um, yeah. I think Cosmos was a decade too early, you know, in general, I think like they were solving for the right things, but at the wrong time. And I think more applications as they hit scale and they need a lot more customizability probably makes sense. And different flavors where where you have, but like in you know, my sense of the application that might make a lot of sense are the hardware resource provisioning networks. I think that as a sector has also been very difficult because the UX to their buyers hasn't really been addressed well. And they've been trying to find what kind of customers make sense. Like, for example, there's this CDN project that was going to like the YouTubes of the world. And they were saying, oh, uh, we could reduce your CDN cost by 80%. And that customer said, well, like it's a cost, but it's not a cost center for me. I would double my CDN cost if, if it meant increasing market share or user base. So I think like that flavor of like blockchain app still hasn't found like the use case or the customer base that makes sense. Um, and I think they're still in the idea maze. I think you can compete on cost if you have at least some equal performance uptime in UX. So I think like when they have more feature parity there, I think you could have these distributed network of nodes and you can do a lot of cool stuff around customizing it. I think we're still excited about that sector. It's just been uh, a longer time for a lot of those applications to, to hit PMF. But I think there's something there. So I think like that flavor works particularly well for Cosmos chains and like the DY DX layer. So so I think, you know, it, it, it just might be like a more niche segment, but I feel optimistic that they might find something, uh, but you just need to be mindful that it's not just the Cosmos devs that are looking at these things. It's also folks that are building their counterparts uh, on ETH rollups. I have a similar feeling. For the most part, I don't think Cosmos and Ethereum can co- coexist in the long term. It's one of them will crush the other. But if Ethereum crushes Cosmos, I think Cosmos is probably not dead. It probably is going to remain some niche. And what I'm seeing now is you have these chains that are, for the most part, infrastructure chains like Axelar, Thor chain, 
despite being a, a cross-chain DEX, I consider that as infrastructure because it's it's really about bridging, right? Thor chain, band protocol, you know, it's an oracle. And there's a bunch of like these like middle layer like infrastructure stuff, right? That are built on Cosmos. And that seems to be the the niche that, that Cosmos has found so far. Like these product would prefer to to build on Cosmos than on a Ethereum roll-up app chain. And probably for good reasons. I don't know what the reasons are, but there, there's probably really good reasons why the specific group of projects all gravitate towards uh, Cosmos. So that's my view on things long term. I agree with this view, by the way. Some chains or some applications will have will require will will prefer to have their own infrastructure, everything under the control. Yeah. If DYDX kept growing the way the same rate they have been growing, I think it's better for them to stay as an app chain. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, have their own validators even, why not? Uh, games, if they come become really big, then why not? But overall, smaller applications or like the liquidity hub can be, be will I think it will, Ethereum will win in overall over, <laughs> over a long enough time. And we talked a lot about this, Chow, which is like, is Cosmos too decentralized for its own good versus Ethereum, which is, Lord, has this Lord kind Vitalik. of centralizing factor of like groups, right? You have the research group, Lord Vitalik that's at the helm, right? Then you have all different research groups and you have these communities that are underneath it. That's kind of propelling Ethereum forward, right? Compared to Cosmos, like, you know, like I don't even know who to look at. Like I look at Zaki and maybe Sunny, right? So, and then there are, there isn't like, they just got a a grants program that just started a couple months ago, right? Before that, they didn't even have a grants program that's like, that you could apply to. So I feel like a part of this like slowness against Ethereum is also partially how it's organized from a social construct perspective. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, thank you, uh, Dimitri, for joining us. It was a great chat. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun. For those that haven't uh, hit subscribe, hit subscribe. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for listening to Good Game. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next week.